Well, today as we begin the season of Advent, a journey toward Christmas, where we will once again reflect on the birth of Jesus and what it meant now and for a world in need of a Savior, we'll be reflecting on how much his birth and even death provided us. And if we dare, we'll even consider how much hasn't changed a bit in our lives or in the world since its arrival and departure. We'll discern why that's a big deal now and for eternity, but for now in week one of Advent, we wait. And waiting can be tough, but we're in good company. You see, the very first Christmas was all about waiting. Whether our time is flying by or it seems like it's inching along, we have the luxury of knowing what's coming. Maybe not in everything we're waiting for, but the light at the end of Advent, a season that can feel dark at times. Now, there's a sense of certainty about it, even in the unexpected. The service you partake in online or in person might be different than this year's past. The people around the table might be different this year too. The types of gifts may have changed since the last time you gathered, but we know that ultimately Christmas is coming, both the arrival of the holiday and the arrival of Jesus. But waiting is tough. Now, one of the absolute worst punishments I heard of growing up was getting soap in the mouth like Ralphie from A Christmas Story. Yuck. I couldn't imagine having that last for even a moment. A close second, watching paint dry. Now, to be honest, we had wallpaper, so the likelihood of my parents actually following through with that threat was minimal. But it made me pause for a moment to consider just how long I'd have to sit there waiting for the punishment to come. Because the idea of waiting... It isn't ideal, to say the least. It kind of feels like a punishment. It feels like it's something we have to survive through to thrive on the other end. We are an instant gratification society, after all, where we want things to go our way in our timing. But what if it's not about our timing? What if it's not even about us, but instead about what Jesus is doing in us in the here and now, and what Jesus has been doing up until this point to prepare us for what is to come? As we kick off our Advent season here at Good Shepherd, we're invited to not simply sing, O come, O come, Emmanuel, while we wait for the coming King to be among us, but instead are invited to redefine what waiting is and what it can look like as we prepare for his arrival. Now, I think for many of us, waiting is like watching the paint dry slowly. It's boring. We check out. We become drowsy. We might even fall asleep. Rinse and repeat, right? Or maybe the idea of waiting is a painful or frustrating reminder of your past that's reared its ugly head into the present and feels like it might become part of your future too. It's seasons like this where we might opt for that fresh bar of soap over the bad taste currently in our mouths as we simply sit and wait for what feels like an eternity for the next move. Waiting might be all of those things, but it doesn't have to define our moment here and now. And it certainly doesn't have to define us. Instead, we're invited by Jesus to stay alert, to be prepared, to live into the moment. Because even with the realities that loom all around us, we can be fully present in the hope that will come to us. And that indeed gives me hope for today and hope for tomorrow. Today, it might feel like a ripped page, but it doesn't define the outcome of your story as a whole. The chapter might be hard to read, but it's only a part of the overall story. And I believe it's a story that's still being written. And the author? Well, the author's inviting you to wait. That's because in our preaching text today, the author of our story is still having his story written. And he invites us to take part in the waiting of what is to come as we examine our own story in light of it. So wait. But know that waiting doesn't mean to do nothing. Quite the contrary, in fact. During the holiday season, we do lots of baking and cooking at the Wilson household. And you better believe we followed directions. Alexa, set a timer for 17 minutes. Not 15, not 20. Whatever the box says. For best results, do this. This is what Jesus is telling his followers. But will we follow his directions? Or assume that we know a better recipe? As the message put it, we're hearing a story about waiting and what is to come. But the exact hour and day, no one knows that. Not even heaven's angels. Not even the Son, only the Father. So keep a sharp lookout, for you do not know the timetable. It's like a man who takes a trip, leaving his home and putting his servants in charge, each assigned a task and commanding the gatekeeper to stand watch. So stay at your post, watching. You have no idea when the homeowner is returning, whether evening, midnight, cockcrow, or morning. 
You don't want them showing up unannounced while you sleep on the job. I say it to you, and I'm saying it to all. Stay at your post and keep watch. Now in this text, Jesus is inviting his followers to stay alert and follow directions as they await the master's arrival. The waiting that we've been talking about becomes less of a chore and more of an invitation of involvement in the here and now, and how it will prepare us for what is to come. The idea of waiting shifts from being passive to being active. You heard that right. Our active participation moves us past passive waiting to what it is that Jesus is foretelling. Did the followers follow his directions? I don't want to spoil the Christmas story, nor the Easter story for that matter, but the answer is no. Historically, we haven't followed directions, and we've gotten burned worse than my Christmas cookies. But charred or crumbled as we've been throughout the ages, whether destruction or temples or miraculous rebuilding is an order for our lives, Jesus gives us an abundance of mulligans. But like the things that we bake and cook, we don't want to yearn for them to be perfect, only to have them turn out blah. We want them to be as the recipe called for. The gospel reading that Jesus' followers or warning in the gospel of Mark are clear. Whether we're in a healthy season or a rebuilding season, we need to be intentional about our approach to today and tomorrow. Honestly, this sounds like the parable of the Minnesota Vikings, or twins, or wild, or you get the picture. Don't settle, don't throw in the towel, don't give up. Stick to the winning game plan, and if you don't have one, find it. I find it interesting that this Advent text from the Revised Common Lectionary actually takes place immediately before and points directly toward the biggest part of the season of Lent, Jesus' death and resurrection. But I wonder if we don't take the direction of Advent without the reality of Lent, where Jesus came to this earth to show the way, warned us as we pivoted from the very directions he gave us to follow, and ultimately finished the recipe for us because we simply couldn't do it ourselves. So what did Jesus desire for God's people then? What does he desire for us now? He desires what God desired all along. Way back when in Isaiah, we hear this prophetic word, Oh, that you would rend the heavens and come down, that the mountains would tremble before you. As when fire sets twigs ablaze and causes water to boil, come down to make your name known to your enemies and make the nations to quake before you. For when you did awesome things that we did not expect, you came down and the mountains trembled before you. Since ancient times, no one has heard, no ear has perceived, no eye has seen any God besides you who acts on behalf of those who wait for him. You come to the help of those who gladly do right, who remember your ways. But when we continued to sin against them, you were angry. How then can we be saved? Well, the answer is this. We're saved by the one who would come and is returning. God kept his promises with Israel and even showed what it would look like to be faithful, to follow the Lord's expectations for them and for humanity, And so we're called to do the same, to watch, to be alert, to prepare ourselves, to take action, be active participants rather than passively waiting for Jesus to come. I think when we do this, we're not the only ones that experience Jesus here on earth. So in a season of waiting, I pray it feels less like a punishment and more like an opportunity for growth, less like an expectation and more like a reward, less like something we want to keep to ourselves and more like a feast we share with our neighbors. We're called to be lights after all, Good Shepherd. As Will Willimon says, we become signs pointing toward the one who is coming. Are we illuminating properly? Are our batteries charged? The answer may be yes, the answer may be no, but the outcome is still the same. Jesus who came to us is using us to point others toward him. So be prepared. Change the definition if you need to and allow Jesus to do a work in your life. May it be so. Amen. Let us pray. Creator God, in this season of Advent, as we wait, God, I pray that you'd send your spirit down to give us comfort and peace in a trying time or to remind us that the joy we have comes from you. Be with us now and always. It's in your name that we pray. Amen.